So Michael Goder, oh my gosh, I have been so excited to have you on here. Um, for those of you who know Michael, for those of you who don't, he has been just a pillar of success. And I think of you as the Energizer Bunny. You were the <laughs> owner of success for others where you went in and you trained business owners, sales, um, comfort advisors, service techs, and people absolutely loved your training. And then you went into different elements, working with different companies, and you ended up where you're at now with environmental heating and air, and you are now a partner. And last year, in the midst of a pandemic, you grew 71%, and you were listed on Inc.'s 5,000, uh, America's most fastest growing companies. And I just like, I'm in awe. Like, I'm in awe. But we miss budget by 7%. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hunger, right? That's the hunger. So just thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm excited. When I got your call, it really, uh, it stirred up a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, great memories. And just, uh, you always help redirect me. So, you know, whenever I need to get um, grounded and, and get back on, in, on focus, um, you know, I talk to Mary and you know, things start to go down the right track again. I get that Energizer Bunny feeling back and I get fired up and, and shit happens. So it's uh, it's good. I've been super excited since we talked. That's amazing. So get, um, as we get into this, before we just dive into your title, give us a little bit of background. Like who is Michael Goder? <laughs> How did you ever get into the HVAC industry? Well, if you ask my guidance counselor back in uh, upstate New York, you know, in, in junior year of high school, she would have or he would have said uh, the least likely to succeed. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's it's funny. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, upstate New York. Um, you know, five brothers and sisters, five of us kids, uh, mom and dad. Um, you know, we were we were raised in a in suburbia, you know, for the most part. And uh um, life was was what it was. I mean, went to school, um, you know, I had friends I'd gone through, through grade school with from, you know, probably first grade all the way up to, um, you know, sophomore. Um, life takes a quick turn around 14, 13 years old where parents split up. Uh, mom was a was a homemaker. You know, she's Wonder Woman, right? She has all these superpowers. She's taking care of five kids, doing everything she can do. Uh, well, now she finds herself. She's got to go to work. Um, parents divorce, uh, life changes and life changed fast. And so um, we went from a, a high school where I knew everybody, you know, you're popular, you're good at sports, you're at, you know, coaches all knew you, teachers all knew you, um, had an older brother who had kind of paved the way for me and three younger sisters coming behind and um, life was just pretty good. And then when we, when the parents divorced, we moved. And when we moved, the, uh, we went from suburbia to, you know, Chipple. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. So excuse my language. I, um, but okay. we, life changed. I mean, it, it became a real struggle. Mom's running three jobs. You know, she was gone before we woke up in the morning. She was home after we went to bed at night. Everything she could do to, to you know, put sneakers on her, her five kids feet and trombones in their hands and whatever events we wanted to do, she didn't want to miss out. Um, so, but as a kid, you know, I remember growing up and, and when I was laying in bed, I had, you know, a, a Porsche 959 silver on my wall and I had a Lamborghini Diablo on the other wall and Michael Jordan and, you know, just these dreams and aspirations, you fall asleep at night and be like, man, this is, you know, life is so good and I'm going to get that. I'm, that's, I'm, that's gonna be my garage. And then when all this happened, it, it changed everything, um, changed high school's junior year. Uh, went from being popular and having friends and being, you know, you're just on the basketball team, right? You're just on the football team. You're just, now I got to try out, like, wait a minute, what is this? Um, so it changed my focus, changed my surroundings, changed my focus has changed. Um, the highlight of school was pretty much uh, where were we going to skip class? Where were we going to go? What were we going to do? And just um, um, went to a, a, a different place, I guess. And uh, but the whole time it was like, no, this isn't cool with me. Like, I, I just, this isn't what I want. I want something more. So senior years, for senior year, the guidance counselor called him and had her come in. And I had sold him um, and convinced him that the best thing that we could do was for me to drop out of high school. And he tried to sell my mom on the idea that I think it's a great idea for your son to drop out of school. Um, and he can pursue his GED and all this other stuff uh, because I had... I had moved out the day I got my license at 16. I moved out of the house um, to pay my own way. Well, in doing so, you got to have a job. So I worked overnights 
I had, you know, um, bended the truth a little bit and said that I worked for my mom during the day. So I had to have night shift, but really I was going to high school during the day and I worked from 11 to seven at night at a printing company, um, the overnight shift. So I was making money. Um, they had given me an opportunity for a promotion to move out to California thinking that I was, you know, not a high schooler. And of course I accepted the position company car and company housing and all this living. So I was like, all right, I'm in. So I had to sell my guidance counselor on dropping out of school. And I, so I laid it all out for him and he's like, yeah, this is a great opportunity. You should do it. And my mom lost it when she came into the guidance counselor and uh, she's like, I cannot believe that you're sitting here, you know, supporting the fact that my son should drop out of school. Um, so that took me on a path across country. I went from New York at uh, 17 years old to California, lived on my own, um, you know, life slaps you in the face pretty quick. Uh, from there, I went to Chicago, um, same printing company, um, you know, making good money, thinking that I, you know, was going to live the life of my dreams. But then I got real homesick. You know, I had three sisters that I just, I never really grew up with because I moved away when they were young. Um, you know, my brother, my mom. So I got real homesick about 19, 20, um, left Chicago, came back home one weekend, kind of unannounced and said, you know, I quit. I'm here. Um, your problem again, mom, and moved into her basement. And um, needed a job. So my dad um, worked for a very large, very successful heating and air conditioning company out there. So I knew he knew the trades. Um, he was a, a somebody that never hired anybody for anything. So as even as a kid, we were taught, you know, that uh, if you're digging a ditch, even if the guy's 40 and you're 13, right, you drop us off at these job sites, the ditch had to be deeper, longer, straighter, by lunch than the guy next to you, you know? And so you just got this competitive nature and competitive um, life as a competition mentality and I can do better, I can do it myself. So when I moved back, I kind of said, all right, dad, I need a job. Um, and we weren't on the best of terms at that time, but he said, well, come to my school and I'll teach you. And if you can do it, then I'll get you a job. So I went to a school, nobody thought I could do it because I was kind of a pretty boy. I didn't like to get dirty. Um, you know, I was more of a jock type of thing, I guess you could say, but um, didn't like to get my hands dirty. And so I got into the trade school and, you know, it was, uh, I loved it. I mean, I ate it up. It was, uh, got to rip out all this old stuff and put in new stuff and make it look like a masterpiece. And so fast forward, he gets me a job at Isaac Heating and Air Conditioning where things kind of changed. I mean, that company there really gave me some good direction and some solid foundations to build on. And I'll never forget Ray signed us up for a class when I first, I went to install, installed for many years, but he signed us up for this class. It was all about mindset and it was all about, you know, you know, your thoughts and, and, you know, what you think about you become and, and all this stuff that we hear, but it really resonated with me. It really clicked to where like, you know what, anything is possible. Like, and I kind of went back and, uh, um, started to apply it and just in really, it changed me. I mean, it really changed me because I was brand new into sales. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a young kid with still pimples on my face. Um, people who were closest to me, you know, some people that were closest to me didn't think that I could do it right. You're too young to sell. Nobody's going to trust you. You're only 23, 24, whatever. Um, and it just, that just fired me up and pissed me off. So, um, just started to really dive into myself, um, and really learn, you know, what, I don't know how to develop, you know, how to, how, okay, I want to be a salesman. Who, who's the best salesman out there? Okay. Tom Hopkins at the time. All right. Well, what does Tom Hopkins have? And I didn't have a lot of money. So it was, it was like, okay, I'm buy a book, right? A book's not expensive. So I can't go to a seminar because that's cross country, but I could buy his book and I could read his book 17 times and, and, and own it. And, um, and so that really was what started me down this path was that class and then, you know, things, you know, seeing people around me that, you know, were progressing. And, you know, I said, sales guys that, you know, had, you know, 35 foot boats and nice cars and nice houses. And you're like, man, I want that. I want, I can do this. I want that. And so I got really focused on me. And then, um, and from there, I mean, it just, it just led me on the path that I'm on now um, to be where I am today. So um, yeah, I mean, he, environmental heating and air solutions. And, you know, we're outside of Sacramento was a great opportunity for me uh, two and a half years ago, uh, partnered with these guys and just, um, we have just, done some amazing things but um it's really just the, the getting everybody just puts in the work right i mean they just all believe and and uh they they get behind the cause and and i have a very clear vision as to what i want and and i'm not going to stop till i get it and and it's fun so that's kind of how i got here <laughs>
You know, it's interesting listening. Who sells their guidance counselor on it's okay to drop out of school? I mean, so sales yep. were it was in your blood from a very small, you know, young child. Yep. Yeah. It, it was um so this morning I was actually listening to a couple of goal casts and Dwayne the Rock Johnson was on there and it's his story. There's actually a few similarities with what you just shared. And he said something on there. He said, you got to be hungry. You know, there's that saying, you got to be hungry. He said, but I had to live my life like I was starving. And that mindset, it allows you to actually start to take the steps that you're taking that, that you took. Yeah. And, you know, um, the Navy SEALs, they talk about adversity. You're forged in adversity to be able to step out at 17 years old. And, you know, at 17, we think we're invincible. Oh, but yeah. to have the wings to actually fly, to put some experience underneath your, your boots, so to speak, and to come back, you had to suck up the ego to go back to that. Yeah. And it's right. interesting how there's so many things in our life that create these defining moments. But I really believe, Michael, it's people like you that separate so many of the others, is that the hunger was there, the willingness to dig in. The willingness to say, wait a minute, what are other people doing? Yeah. Because I've seen so many people who are high achievers, but there's so much ego. And it's not saying you don't have an ego. <laughs> it's a healthy ego, right? <laughs> but the, the healthy ego versus the ego, like I can do this better. Right. And they don't learn from other people. They just want to create. Right. What you did created a blueprint for everything that you're doing yeah. and everything that you've done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, and, and that was a turning point. Like, I, I've always been competitive, but like you said, it, it really comes down to, um, you know, being sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? I mean, you, 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 I started life with with a certain path and, and a certain comfort level and security level, and then that went away. And mm -hmm. and you realize real quick, and I, I can I can piece this together today in my mind. Back then, I had no clue because I was a 17-year-old punk kid that knew everything. Um, but, you know, and, and I didn't like that. I didn't like that turn. And, and you realize real fast that, you know, it, it's, it's in your control. Like it's, it's up to you. Like nobody's going to, yeah, mom's there for you. Mom will always be there for me. Right. But at the end of the day, it's 100% up to me to make my life, whatever it is I want. And, you know, I can, I can talk about it. I can keep the posters on the wall and dream about it or I can get to work and, and really, and, and the only way to be seen, I think in, in, in work, at least what I was taught, and this comes from my old man was, you know, you, you do it better than everybody else. It, life is a competition. Like it is a competition. I don't care just because I live in California right now. doesn't mean everybody gets a trophy, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it life's a competition. And if you want to be seen, um, you need to do something and perform at a level where people recognize and, and, and take it in. Like, did you see what he did? You know, like, look at that kid. He's still working. Everybody else is on break. He's still going. Um, and you got to get noticed. And, and so, you know, that's really what it boiled down to. And then once you get on that path, you're like, well, shit, you know, um, I'll never forget, you know, uh, to me, it was a big deal. Like my whole life, I'm like, oh, I want to make six figures, right? I, I just want to make a hundred thousand dollars. And then it was like this big, huge, like, BHAG, right? Something that just was just so far out of reach when you're you're scrapping to pay rent in a one bedroom apartment, right? And 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 don't know how you're going to put gas in your car. Um, but there's this big burning desire that if I felt like if I could make it to a hundred thousand, like my life would just instantly change, like everything would be different. So I'll never forget when I actually did it, and um, you know, I had, I'd had a conversation with my dad and and said, you know, well, what did you make last year, right? And and he was like, well, I'm I'm not that's private information, you know, we can't share. He might even be on, so I apologize, but um, you know, that's private information, and I you know I'm not going to share that. I'm like, well, I'll share mine, right? And I I put it on the desk, you know, like because it was like this moment, like I did it. You see, like like I I, I can do this. I mean, it's I can do anything I want, and there it is. It took me, you know few years but there it is I'm never going backwards and now it was and that just started this it just kept feeding the machine um for this energy of just like okay well if I did that what else can I do I mean how do you make a quarter of a million dollars how do you make a half a million how do you make a million how do you you know how do you do you know and, and so it all became money focused um and that was my report card right so I might not have gotten my college or my high school grades but my W-2 was my report card. And so that was something I studied and I learned and I analyzed like, okay, if I raised, 
this just a little bit, what impact would that have over the 12 months? And then, geez, that brought my income $7,000. or so that would bring up my earnings $12,000 or, and I started to dissect things. And as I did that, you, you know, you get more what you focus on. So, you know, when you're focused all about money and, and that's another thing with like today's world, you know, we're, we're programmed in a way that money's a bad thing. Right. And, you know, you hear people say stuff all the time, like, well, money doesn't, you know, make you happy or, um, you know, and it's, it's like, money's the root to all evil and and it's more about you know health and family and i get all that stuff but if you're going to use the verse use the whole verse right i mean love of money is 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 the root to all evil but money itself is a really good thing and it's a powerful tool um and if you have it i'm sorry it does create more happiness it can extend your life it can give you a you know you give you things that you know others can't have it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a vehicle that can be used it's a very powerful vehicle but we're almost trained to to and this is again going back to that class of changing a mindset is 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 really it's, it's it's a vehicle that can be used it's not a bad thing so to think about you know i call it stinking thinking right i mean we, we get thought we get caught up in all these bad thoughts like oh well money's not going to make me happy well I mean, really, I challenge that. Like, money will make you happy. I mean, it will definitely apply to your happiness. Now, if you're miserable before you got money, you're just going to be even more miserable, um, you know, when you get do get it. But at the end of the day, it's this thinking, thinking. I remember driving around in an Oldsmobile station wagon. Um, my mom had, and the two back seats faced the wrong. The back seat faced the wrong direction. So my brother and I always got to sit back there and awkwardly stare at uh, people at stoplights, you know, and, and, you know, we didn't have cell phones and video games and all that stuff, right? I mean, um, cell phone had a shoulder strap on it back then. So you just sat there and awkwardly stared. And I remember her saying things like, you know, um, even if we had the money, I'd never buy a car like that. Um, meanwhile, I'm in the back like, shit, I would. <laughs> like, absolutely, I want that car, right? Or drive by a really nice house. It's like, you know, even if we had the money, um, I'd never buy that house. You know, money's not everything. And, and you hear this stuff, but I always, it never really was comfortable to me. Like, well, wait a minute. No, I, I want that. I mean, I tell my wife all the time, like, she's like, well, what do you what are your goals? I'm like, I want a house so big that we got to chase each other around in segways, right? I mean, like, how cool would that be? And, uh, you know, life wouldn't suck if you if you had 10,000 square foot on the ocean like yeah it might be you know ridiculous amount, but life doesn't suck um so it's just that was that was a big thing for me you know back in the day was just listening to other people and how they internalized thoughts and, and and what they verbalized um what I was comfortable with what I wasn't and I made it a mission like you know what I'm I'm gonna live the life of my dreams and and I had a mentor when I first um, got in the industry and in sales, um, Rick was his name, and, and he really challenged my thinking a lot and said, you know, you know, look no further than your bathroom mirror as to why you are where you are in life, and um, if you want to go get it, and he just always pounded me and gave me homework all the time and held me accountable all the time and pushed me to a level of uncomfort that I'd never been to before, um, but it all helped, right? I mean, it all molded it all together to where, you know, I started to believe, like, you know what, I can do this. I, I can really I can live the life of my dreams, but the thing that he said to me that I try to say to my kids and even, you know, my team now is you only get one shot at this thing called life, right? I mean, when it's over, it's over. I mean, newsflash, right? You're, you're going to die. There's not a person on this program right now that's not going to die. Um, and it sucks and it, to think about, but on the reverse side, it's like, okay, how do you want to live? You know, how is it that you want to live your life? And, and if, do you want it to be mediocre do you do you when you know how many people get to their deathbed right and and heaven forbid and they, they have regret and they're like man i wish i would have if only i would have done this or if only i would have done that and i wonder if i could achieve that it's like you know life is short man it's i want it all i mean i'm not even going to be i mean caught tall you, you know it's, it's confidence whatever you want to call it that aura but it, it's not uh, ego it's you know what i want it all I want everything I've ever dreamed about. I deserve it. I'm going to work for it. I'm going to get it. And we're going to live life of my dreams. So when it's over, I can sit there and go, you know what? My kids, they had it all. I mean, I gave them everything I could give them. You know, my wife has, has you know, got the life of her dreams. I've got the life of my dreams. The people that I surround myself with, their quality of life has increased um, because of my influence or because of, of something that they might have picked up from me, whether it be through a sales class or, or a, a seminar or something like this. I mean, that is what um, it's all about. I mean, I, I look at life as a competition and, you know, you would ask me a question when we were on the phone the other day. It's like, you know, where's the, 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 the drive, where's the passion come from? And, 
And I think, you know, I haven't been able to answer with my finger on, but I, the best I can come up with is, 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 you know, losing sucks. I mean, it's just, I mean, you just, when you win a basketball game or a football game, or you win anything, any kind of contest that's competitive, you, that feel a sale, right? I mean, I don't know that there's anything better than the feeling of winning or closing a sale for me, right? I mean, it's like, it's here. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, and so just to win is, is that feeling is so good. But when you lose something or you had your sights on something, you missed it. Like, how does that feel? And that feeling sucks. It's your mindset, right? It, I go listening to you. It's so interesting because we work with so many people. And your, your mindset is a belief as what's possible. You live in the, what is possible. I can do this. There's nothing I can't do. Why wouldn't I do this? Yet the majority, and there's so many studies that show that people, when things happen, they live with excuses, regrets. They're not willing to do the hard work. Not that they're not willing. They just don't know how, you right. know, it's pain and pleasure. And it's whatever we put our focus on and and it really is our beliefs and how we uh, attach those beliefs and how we give meaning to things and you know as I listen to you and I love you know people who are just like these amazing sales people amazing athletes there's something underneath the hood that drives you in a different way than a lot of people and it is this it's the internal it's this belief it's this passion it's something that comes from inside, not from outside. And I really believe that a lot of times where people get stuck is because they're looking for outside, fill me up. There's a hole there that they're not being filled. And so they're always searching. But I have a question for you. So within your journey, did you feel like you had to prove that you were good enough, that you were smart enough? Every day, okay. every day. And at first it was, for everybody else. I mean, yes, I was the, the I was the recipient of the efforts and, the, and everything else, but it wasn't for me. It was, you know, you got to make mom proud, right? I mean, we want mom to be like, oh, there's my boy, right? I mean, it was for her. It was, you know, to prove my dad wrong or to prove him right, whichever it was, but it was, it was, it was out of, um, it was, it was to really show people, you know, because Again, I mean, you go back and, and I don't regret any decisions I've made. I mean, they've made me who I am today, but, you know, it always kind of is burning there. Like, you know, you dropped out of high school, you know, like, like I have two boys, right? And, and, and those boys both graduated high school. So um, everybody in my house graduated high school, but, but me, right? So, I mean, it, it's one of those things that, you know, you always look back on and like, man, um, I don't know. You just, you, you got to prove it. At first you start proving to other people because it's easier. Right. And when I got to prove it to my dad that I can make a hundred thousand when, you know, it was never possible. And I live in this, what, you know, what most people around me would call, you know, my dream world, my rainbows and unicorns. Right. I mean, that was always it. Like, Oh, Michael, you got all these rainbows and unicorns, man, rainbows and unicorns. And, um, but I bought into it. I mean, I literally was, I mean, I'm all in on anything I do. I, I'm very, if I, if I like something, I'm going a hundred percent in. If, if I don't like it, I'm not ever doing it again. I, I don't need to do it again. Um, it, it's, it, and that's just the way I'm wired. So yeah, at first, yeah, you're absolutely right. It was, it was to prove something. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a high school counselor. Maybe it was, you know, friends that I hadn't talked to in a long time that, you know, I always admired and, and always looked up to that. I knew they had it so well together and put together. And then you see on Facebook, you know, everybody's a rock star on Facebook, right? So you're like, oh, well, they're doing so great. And, and you know, and I've got to make this work. Like, I mean, did I make the right decision? And, and you just, you know, and, and then there's people to your right and to your left. Like, I mean, it, it goes right back to, you know, if somebody's excelling in something around me, I got to win. I mean, I have to, I have to uh, prove to them that, you know what, I'm just as good or I'm right there with you. I'm going to give you a hell of a run. You might win, but I'm going to give you a hell of a run. Next time we get back together, you're going to bring your A game because you know, I didn't let off the gas at all. in, in our, and while we separated ways um, and that's just, what's always driven me a hundred percent. Now, when you get, now that I'm older um, it's really not the outward stuff anymore. It's more, you know, inward, it's more like, okay, what do I really want? Like, cause I know I can get it. It's just, what do I really want? And why does it matter? And, and I think that's a deeper question is, you know, the Lamborghini, make no mistake, there'll be one in my garage. Uh, there's no doubt, but why do I want the Lamborghini? And, and that's more important than, you know, cause it's cool, right? And R8 is cool too. Uh, but there's something there. And, and that's what, it, you know, that's the stage I'm at right now where it's like, okay, what do you want? Why do you want it? And is it in line with 
with, you know, with everything that I'm doing and where I'm going. And, and it's trying to keep everything in line. That's hard now because, you know, as you, you, you said it, right. I mean, you work, you work, you work and the, and the results, but it, it, you said it starts with the thoughts. I mean, I always trained a, a, a real basic equation, right? I mean, thoughts create feelings and emotions and those emotions drives behavior and that behavior drives um, actions that actions drive results. So if you really want different results, you got to change the thoughts first, create change the feelings. Well, you start getting into this feelings world as a dude in the heating and air business, right? I mean, as a contractor, as a burly guy, a tough guy, and feelings are not somewhere you want to go very often, especially somebody like me. I mean, it's just that you never know what you're going to get. And so, um, or what comes up. So it's something that when you start to tap into that, um, then you start to understand the why. And, and I tell you, then, then you just, like you said, the Energizer Bunny on steroids comes out and it's like, here we go. Let's hold on for the ride. I'm going to say it all the time to people around. I'm like, fasten your seatbelt. I'll come out of my office. I'm like, fasten your seatbelt, put your sneakers on. And they just know that something happened in a meeting or something happened. Michael must have read something or Michael's, okay, we're going for a ride, like game on. And then we, we charge the hill. So. so that's a perfect segue into how did you manage to grow your company 71% in the midst of a pandemic where a lot of manufacturers had shortages. So you can't you know, readily get some of your equipment. How did you end up growing so much? What did you do? Well, I, um, that's a great question, Mary. Uh, it, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was, it was, you know what it was? It was really giving somebody, giving others, somebody to follow, giving some others hope, giving some others, you know, the, the, the possibility that this, can happen, right? I mean, you defy the status quo, as we learn, right? I mean, you, you, what are others doing in a pandemic, right? What are other heating and air conditioner contractors doing right now in March of 2020, right? It was, they were retracting, right? They were scared. They were pulling back. They were pulling back, right? They, they, they have a different business model than, than what we believe. Um, and, and so with that, you know, it's okay, well, we got to do the exact opposite, right? I mean, at this point, we got to put the hammer down. Like we have to get focused. Now, there were some hard decisions that had and discussions that were had last March where, you know, we had a triage list. I mean, I knew what we had to do if things happened to get down to, you know, from 50 plus people down to 12 and operate. I mean, I had that filed away and, and it was, and it was planned and it was figured out. That was the worst case scenario. We're going to survive first of all. So being that, that voice of, you know, we can do this. Um, we're going to survive. We're going to get through this like anything else. And having set an example along the way where, you know, one of my philosophies and is, is put people above profits, right? So even here in our office, like our, our, our call center girls and everything else, I mean, I always want them to put themselves in the customer's position. How would you feel if that just, if you were the customer on the other end of the phone? I mean, how would you feel? Would you feel like we did a great service or would you feel like, um, like they feel, would you feel frustrated or would you feel, you know, whatever you're feeling? And if you would, then make it right. Because we want to put the person above the transaction every single time. And so by having some clearly defined, um, who are principles, I guess, you know, it, uh, was first and foremost. And then when people saw that those principles were in line with my actions and my words, that is what started it because without that, it's just hot air, right? I mean, I mean, back when I first started training, I could get on any stage and get people to do whatever I asked them to do just because of the energy, right? I could just, I could fake it till I make it, right? I could come up there and be the Energizer Bunny and rah, 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 I could jump hopping up and down one foot. But when you're, when you're doing it at a team that you live with every day, I mean, they know, you, you know, your, your, your emotions, they know when you're up, they know when you're down, they know when, when things are going good, they know when things are going bad. There's no hiding from any of that. So by having a clearly defined, you know, set of values and then and living to those values and they saw it, well, then that develops trust. And so with that trust came, you know, okay, we can do this. And, and it wasn't just empty words. Like we can do this. Let, let's sit down. Let, let's whiteboard it out. Like we can make this happen. Uh, budget was 78% last year um, increase prior to pandemic. Um, and when pandemic hit, you know, it was, well, we need to change the budget. No. There's no reason to change the budget. We're we're going to we're going to do this. We thought it was possible prior to this. Why can't it why can't it remain possible? Why are we automatically changing the rules of the game? Like, no, how do we make it happen? And so just communicating and then coming up with game plans and 
you know, how do you increase employee? Um, how do you recruit more? Um, how do you, you know, um, maintain a, a, a solid product mix to keep average tickets higher than anybody else? I mean, again, with retraction came, everybody went to, you know, I'm going to start bidding the cheapest systems, the cheapest products I have. Like, look at this great deal I have, Mary. It's it's a 14 seer air conditioner, the 80 percent efficient furnace. It's all you really need in Northern California. This is it. And it's only eight or ten or twelve thousand dollars. Well, go the opposite way. Like, look, this is the world's quietest, most efficient. This is the best that money can buy. This thing is amazing. It's only 28 grand, right? And people are like, I got four other estimates for 12. You're at 28. Like what the, you created a difference and created value by the separation in price. So people are like, okay, they're not saying, well, I got three other estimates for the exact same thing for 12 grand. They're saying, I got three other estimates. Nobody else talked about this shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about it. what do people really want? People people buy what they want, not what they need. I mean, why is Tesla? And this is what again I'm getting into sales now, but why is Tesla selling all their vehicles? Right, you don't need a Tesla. Right, a hundred thousand dollar Tesla is pretty awesome, but at the end of the day, it's not going to pay you back on the gas that you're saving at the pump or the oil change that you don't have to perform anymore. It doesn't make that car payment. It doesn't make any logical sense to buy an electric all electric Tesla car for a hundred grand based on the payment. I mean, you, you, but you want it, it's cool as hell, right? So look, if everybody's buying them. So even in a pandemic, I mean, people haven't stopped spending money. What, what can we look at over the pandemic and say, okay, well, people, people are spending more time in their homes, not less. So they can put higher value on their home. They may not be selling right away when they thought, because they didn't know what the market's going to do. You just got to think, what's the opportunity? What's the opportunity? What's the opportunity versus Oh, you know, pandemic, uh, nobody's going to, you know, everybody's going to be boarded up and nobody's going to do anything. Does your brain literally, does it always go into a solution or was there ever a moment where you just kind of went, oh shit. <laughs> oh, I There's a lot of oh shits, um, but they're normally in private, right? In your truck or in at home or, uh, but no, there's a lot of times where it doesn't always go positive, but that's where the power of the brain is so powerful, right? I mean, that's why it's so important. That's why so many people will never achieve the, a lot of stuff in their life, whereas other people will achieve stuff that is just unfathomable. Like you can't even imagine but that that's even possible and somebody's achieving it and they're doing it at 22, right? Or 19 or 27 or whatever it is. And it's, it's just this because you, we all have those thoughts of doubts. We all get scared. We're all fearful it's, it's how you you react right i mean it's 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 flight fright it's it's fight flight or freeze right so you you're faced with a challenge you're either you're going to do one of those three things every time um so it's stopping it's just pausing it, it's literally and, and i was really bad at closing um when i was in sales i just didn't have the the cojones i guess to ask for the sale and keep fighting like well what is it you need to think about mary and keep battling for the sale and so i'd have to pause and so i just I started training myself um, to count to, you know, five Mississippi or 10 Mississippi. So silence, right? If I asked for the sale, I couldn't speak again for five Mississippi because whoever speaks first buys. So if I fill that silence with void, I just bought the system. If, if you talk, you're going to buy the system. So I think I do the same thing now. I may not consciously count to five Mississippi like I used to at the kitchen table, but um, I do um, pause a lot because I don't have the answer and I'm looking and searching for the answer. Um, and I know it will come to me. It's just a matter of, of a, a real simple process. Stop everything you're doing and just, just really just, just put yourself in a timeout. I don't know how else to say it. And then start to look like, okay, this sucks. Like, um, you know, they're, they're, maybe your lead generators are getting taken out of a, of a, of a store. Or maybe you're not able to execute a, a sales call traditionally where you're going into the house and, and, and going, you know, sitting at the table with the homeowner. Well, what other options are there? I mean, how else can we execute an estimate? How else can we, you know, uh, uh, educate clients? Um, you know, with technology today, I mean, with Zoom, just what we're doing right now. I mean, everybody now is so comfortable with Zoom but you know, to get on virtual estimates immediately and say, hey, listen, we have a solution. Like we can do a virtual estimate, let's FaceTime and you take me to everywhere you need to go. We need to go in the house. You give me all this information. I'll then give you some options and ideas. I'll still, can, I'll still do my drawings. I'll still do everything on the screen. I'll still educate you. Um, and, and that made people comfortable. And, and, it, and it really was something where it didn't slow down sales. Like everybody else was like having their sales guy just call them over the phone. Well it doesn't work right because a sales guy wants to take the least path possible right and, and and but wants all the money right so at that point they're just throwing numbers out to see if you're qualified 
um, versus really working to, to connect with the customer. And so just defining that process as to how we don't lose that connection. Um, we, can, we can build that trust. We can build that, um, that they like us, they trust us, then they'll buy from us um, and just analyzing each step. So time out and then, you know, start, then you have to start looking for the solutions. Life is going to throw us problems all the time. Like there's always going to be a challenge. I mean, every day there's a challenge that comes up in all of our lives, multiples. And, and it's just how you deal with it. I mean, and again, I go back to that mentor, Rick. I mean, he did so many things that helped me in this area where it was, you know, well, yeah, time out, but then can you control it? Is it, if you can't control it, give it no more time. Right. I mean, what would take charge. What can you do about it? If, if it's in the past and you can't change it, well then forget about it and leave it in the rear view mirror. And you know, the rear view mirror is this big on your car, but your windshield is this big, mm -hmm. right? Stay focused out the windshield. That rear view mirror is, is not important. Stay focused on what's in front of you, that lag measure, lead measure type mentality. And so that was, that's really the biggest thing is stop, think about it, and then rally the troops, you know, come up with a, you don't have to have the answers, but if you're surrounded, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find another room. Right. So you surround yourself with people who, who like to be challenged, like, all right, what, Greg, what should we do about this? Right. Jillian, what should we do about this? Matt, what should we do about this? Like, what are we going to do? Let's come together as a group. And what's our next step? How do we how do we accomplish this? And somebody in the room is going to come up with some idea um, and you just got to talk about it and then get behind it and go all in. Like, don't. Well, we'll try it. and We'll see how it works, Mary. Like, we'll give it a shot. Well, you're not all in like we're doing this and we're going to do it for two weeks and let's measure the results and see what happens and, and, and make the decision and everybody rally and go. And normally the results keep that fueling, but if it's a wrong decision, the results suck and you're like, okay, this isn't working. What else can we do? And, that, and that's really what it comes down to, but believing in it. I mean, that's what it, I mean, nobody thought, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like even the Super Bowl. you know, Tom Brady at the end of the day, he's the best, football player, right? as they say, is the goat and all this stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, he doesn't play defense, but he's the one who got that defense to show up that Sunday, right? I mean, through his transfer of belief to others and, and preparing them mentally and preparing them physically to what to expect. And here's how it's going to happen. I mean, Tom is who brought that defense to, to the team, to the, to the field that day and why they didn't let KC even score a touchdown. It wasn't their defense. It was Tom Brady influence on that defense so you know that's what it comes down to is our influence on others and, and rallying the troops and, and and getting them to think like you think because so many people again the world we live in today is so negative it's so i could stand on a corner right now with a can right and a sign and say you know down on hard times please help god bless and people will stop their vehicle they will roll down their window or push the button right i'm dating myself and give that person money Right. But I could stand on a corner right now, the same intersection on the opposite corner and hold up a sign and say, I made it. I did it. I'm a millionaire. I'm successful. Ask me how. Let me help you. And they would think that you're arrogant. They would think that you're conceited. They would think that you're, you know, some pompous prick, essentially. Right. We celebrate misery for some reason or we that we have this acceptance to it that it's okay like we, we live in a world where that's okay and and you know you're you're don't worry about it you'll be okay you'll do better next time it's like no you messed up here and here and if you want different results then fix here and here and guess what you'll get different results but we don't celebrate the success we don't celebrate um all the you know those kind of things it's it's more you know sympathy like you said they're looking for everybody's looking for somebody else to fill their void. And, and it doesn't happen that way. And you hear it even, I mean, I'm sure you hear it and everybody on, I mean, you, you'll hear people all the time say, there's things that drive me nuts. Number one is I'll try. Freaking hate that, right? Either you're going to do it or you're not. Just don't lie to me, right? Either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. But don't tell me you're going to try to do it because we both know how that's going to end. You're not going to do it and you're going to have some excuse as to why it didn't happen. It wasn't your fault. I already know the narrative of that story. So just stop saying try. And the other thing is, is that, is that for some reason, you know, um, I work so hard, Mary. I mean, I get there so early and I stay so late. Like, I don't care. I mean, it, it, it may sound horrible, but this is the way I think. The, the, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how many hours you clock. What matters is the results that you get from the efforts that you put in. Somebody could could dial a hundred phone calls in, a, in, in two hours and have a, a, a 2% close rate and, and get two sales. Whereas somebody could call a hundred calls in, in two hours and get 
10 sales, right? And have a 10%. I mean, the results are what matters. They both work the same amount of time. They both made the same amount of phone calls or effort, if you will. But one really would, is, is more skilled than the other. And so their results were better. So, you know, I am a big fan on efficiency because I like to do things outside of work as well. And so if I can get more results in a shorter period of time, well, then that equals freedom. And, and freedom is, you know, again, we got one shot at life and I want to spend it with my wife and my kids and doing things. So it's about efficiency. Those are the, don't try and, and let your results speak. Don't tell me how hard you work. I don't care how hard, all of us work hard. Everybody works hard, but what results are you getting? Well, so that going into a high performer, because you're absolutely, I, I listen to you, it's like, there's two different people here. Like you are this driver, the salesperson, this motivator. <clears throat> And I get why people, when they listen to you, it's just like, you fire people up. <laughs> and then there's this, okay, but underneath the hood, there are always things going on. And how do you create balance? Because knowing you're such a driver, how do you shut that off at night so that you can be present with your wife, with your family? What are some of the things that, that you do to create balance? Talk to you. <laughs> uh -oh. You know, balance is one of those things that, um, you know, it, it's up and down. Or, I mean, it, it's some, first and foremost, I mean, the things that I value most in life, I make sure know that I value them most in life. So verbally, right? I mean, it, it's one thing to, to, yeah, you get off the phone with your wife. You're like, oh, I love you, babe. Oh, I love you too, right? But it's, it's really, my wife knows from a very deep level how much I care about her. There's no question in her mind. How much I care about her. She is my queen, right? And and everything I do, I do yes for myself, but for her, right? The, the man's job, and this is not sexist by any means, but this is the way I just learned it, right? A, a man's job back in the early '90s was to provide and protect. Those two things were taught to me at a young age. Like your job as a man of the house is to provide and protect. I take it very serious. Like I'm going to protect my family. I'm going to provide for my family. Um, those have always been kind of cornerstones. So. There's no question, but the balance isn't always there. But if, if it's, if it's, if the intention is well known and if the communication is good and the trust is there and, and, and that's a big thing with relationships, right? Is, is um, trust isn't always there because communication a lot of times sucks, right? We don't always tell our spouse or some other what we're thinking or what we're feeling. There's a feeling word again, um, you know, or, or what we're, what our intentions are, uh, what our goals are. And I had to be real careful in the beginning because remember, I mean, I was a 21 year old punk kid, um, um, you know, that, that, uh, that was telling my wife, like, this is what we're, this is the ride we're going on. Right. I mean, I got married at 21. Like, let me tell you, you're going to live the life of your dreams. And I had like $20 in the bank account. Right. I mean, it was like, <laughs> she's like, okay, let's go. So some, you just gotta be careful where you share that. But right at this stage in my life, I mean, she knows, um, that what I say is, is, uh, is going to happen or very, very close, um, of it. So there's trust is solid and there's no question that I care about her. But that being said, there are times um, like recently where it's not, you know, I'm not, I don't turn it off, Mary. That's a challenge. I mean, you, you go home and you're thinking, I mean, COVID, let's face it. I mean, COVID as a, as a, as a, as a leader in any company, I mean, it's changed the face of the business. It's changed stress levels in business. Like, okay, last year it was a negative test result and I could let them come back. And now this year it has nothing to do with negative test results. It's all about a 10 day period or a 15 day period. I mean, I, I'm a heating and air guy, man. I, I installed furnaces for nine years, right? And then I went to sales. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, right? I mean, so now I'm, researching that at night and looking for the answers to that and asking, you know, other people, you know, like Rusty and, and guys that I trust in the industry that I can, I can lean on a little bit to say, Hey, I don't know the answer to this question to you. Uh, so, I mean, it's, but the balance isn't always there, but you got to put yourself in check and, and you know it as a person, you know, when your balance is not there because you go to bed at night and it just doesn't feel the same. It's you're, you're sitting at the kitchen table or you're sitting in the living room with your family and it's not the same level of conversation or eye contact or, or passion or whatever you want to call it. I mean, the connection, you know, that there's a, and you want to avoid it, right? You want to just, if I go to sleep, it'll go away it doesn't go away. And, and so there has to be this every now and again, like, and my wife's real good at grounding me where she's like, look, I need you. 
Like, I just need you. I don't care if we sit in a parking lot and eat an ice cream cone um, in a parking lot in the rain. I could care less. I just need you. Could you turn your phone off for an hour and just sit with me? And we could just sit and look at each other. That's fine. But I need you. And, and that kind of stuff, like, it's so important to, 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 to stay, to, to, for her not to have to say it to me is what's important. When I bring it up to her the next day and be like, you know what, last night, it just, we, we just weren't connected. We spent four hours together, but I don't feel like we spent any time together. And just having that conversation um, and then planning something, that's what keeps everything solid and grounded. Um, they know that I care about them, but they also know that I've got a job to do. And they also know that my job is not an eight to five and never has been. It never will be. Um, it's not Monday through Friday. It's, it's you know, I'm going to chase everything I can chase and get uh, run it up the flagpole as high as I can. And that's 24 seven. So give me five hours, six hours of sleep. And the rest of it is, you know, I'll give you some hours, you some hours, and then let's just go. Um, so the balance is tough, but you just got to stay. When you feel that something's off, address it. That's the biggest advice I can give. Stop what you're doing and address it immediately. The phone can wait. The customers can wait. The employees can wait. You know, your business partner can wait. Everybody else doesn't matter. Right now, it's you better keep home solid because that's the most important thing you've got. Um, it's the most valuable possession I have is my family. And so at that point, um, you know, you, you can we can come back to work and, and we'll keep building. So well, I have a question for you. Okay. Can, what gives you the moment of clarity to make the hard decisions? What pushes you over the edge to go with that one choice? One choice. What uh, help me understand like what do you mean by one choice? Um that moment of passion that puts me over the edge, um, that one choice. I mean, listen, that's all I got. If I'm, if I'm thinking, if I'm hearing the question correct, I don't really have anything else. I mean, I've thought about a situation. I've thought about a, uh, the, 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 what's in front of me. We've analyzed it to the best bet as to what, how can we react to this, right? Because so at that point we come up with a, with a step or a game plan. And then you just get, you just have to get behind it. I mean, you, there can't be any fogginess. There can't be any um, uh, doubt uh, because once doubt sets in, you're not going to give it your all. So it's like, all right, do we all agree? Like that this is the, the direction we want to go and then go for it. And then again, use the data or use whatever measuring sticks that you can to see if it was the right decision, but you have to go all in. You can't, um, you can't half-ass, you can't dip your toe in the water. You got to jump in. And, and when other people see you do that, right? I mean, it, again, sometimes I jump in the wrong direction and we go, you know, three miles off course. Um, but it's really simple to, to just, again, just to say, okay, well, that was wrong, but turn around, come back and then keep on going. I mean, let's, let's regroup. Let's let, but once you make a decision just stick with it and you know, I mean, I use it as a close, right? One of my, my best clothes is the, the pit in the stomach clothes, right? And I've never read it in a book. I've never heard another trainer talk about it. I mean, because it just came out one day with, with me and actually a business owner in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, and it was all, you know, just basically follow your gut, right? I mean, it was just a real, and that's why I think it's it's the most powerful clothes for me is that it's real. And, you know, look, I mean, yeah, I agree. It is a lot of money and this is a major decision and everything else. And from the minute I walked in here, your gut was talking to you, your intuition, your instinct was telling you like, either this guy's full of shit, or this guy could really have a positive impact on our business and on my people. All I'm going to tell you is listen to your gut, man. What should we do? Should we do this or no? Let's just make a decision. Let's go. And he was like, yeah, I think we should do it. Like, cool. Right. And, and it was one of the biggest sales I had had when I was with success for others. Um, but it all came from that, that gut feeling. I mean, follow your gut. Your gut is telling you, you know, what to do, listen to it and go all in. Then don't doubt it. Don't question it. And don't let other people freaking question it. And I only got so much real estate available in my head. I mean, I am, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. So I, I have to be very careful as to who I give space to. Right. I mean, and, and so if I, if I let everybody who has an opinion into my head, I'm never, nothing's ever going to get done. So there was a time in my life where I didn't have really any close associations, mentors, friends, things of that nature. I mean, coming up through, I mean, there was kind of, you know, it was a ramen noodle in the dark kind of, of life for a little while, but, um, but just not giving up the space in my head to where nobody can doubt and nobody can say, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, you didn't think about this and you don't know about this. And, and that's not possible because of this. I didn't have any of that shit. So it was, you know, why can't I do it? Let's go fucking do it. <laughs> and we just did it. Um, 
so that that's the biggest thing i guess i hope and that answers the question yeah and if it doesn't if you would put uh the question for clarity i have another one um what is your morning routine do you have a morning routine and if so what is it so it's changing i mean i've had my best morning routines i know and my current morning routines are not in alignment right now um but they're getting back in alignment so um for me it's it's getting up early right i mean it, the biggest thing is is, is getting up i i'm awake with an without an alarm clock by 5 5 15. i mean it's just I, i'm a morning person now I, older i get the more likely i'm in bed at 9 9 30 at night um but i am up early typically so um, for me, it's coffee. You know, it's it's my little. Um, I've got certain. You know, I want to check um, certain apps on my phone. There's there's certain things um, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at first on my phone just to, to make sure that everything's okay. Um, my ride into work typically consists of you know something, whether it be a, a podcast like this or you know I, I use um, Audible um, and I'll listen to something um, that's an influence. You, know, you had mentioned Maxwell before we went live, right? I mean Maxwell's pretty powerful, but you know, I'm, you know, yesterday there was a conversation and, and Gary V's name came up. Um, I was talking to a gentleman and he's like, yeah, you know, do you know Gary V? And it kind of got me thinking, I'm like, I haven't listened to Gary V in a little while. So this morning it was Gary V, um, Gary Vanderchuk. Um, he got me fired up. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it's just, it doesn't have to be audibles every day. It's, it's just, it's my time. It's whatever I want. Um, now it's, you know, getting up and working out. It's, it's, you know, I want to start, you know, getting myself in better health. I want to feel better. So, you know, we bought our Christmas gift to each other was, you know, all this gym. We, now we have an in-home gym. Um, so now it's like, we're all hooked, but you know, who knows? I, I hope that it stays, but that's today. That wasn't two weeks ago. Um, but it's my time. It's whatever I want it to be. Cause I know once I walk to the front door and sometimes I park around the corner before I even get to the office, cause I'm not ready. Um, you know, I just, I'm just not maybe feeling it. I'm not in my zone. And, and let's face it, everybody looks to you when you walk in the front door, they're all, all eyes are on you. How you respond is, is everybody's going to assume, um, and, and, and gravitate to that. So sometimes I'm not ready. I mean, there's a church, big, huge church, right, right across the parking lot from us, a mega church. I might pull in the church parking lot because I'm not just ready yet. I'm going to finish my cup of coffee. I'm going to get my, you know, what do, what's, what's the game plan for today? What do I got to do? And, and, then how am I going to show up? I don't have that conversation with myself. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I ask myself that question every day, but I know internally that's what's going on to where when I do back the truck into my spot and I walk in that front door, I'm ready to walk in that front door. And there's a certain posture and aura and, and energy that has to be there because who knows what just happened. I mean, other people were here an hour and a half ago and could have been fed just, you know, seven shit sandwiches before, you know, I walk in. And so it, it could be kind of, you, you walk in and kind of just take an assessment and then boom, and just go, you know, hammer down. That's so powerful. What you just said, I was actually given that lesson years ago. I was in a, a sales role, I was actually in a leadership company. And I walked in and actually was Eric was my boss at that time. We weren't married. And he looked at me and he said, what's up? And I'm like, I'm good. He goes, no, your energy's off. I need you to walk back out that door, do whatever you need to do and come back. And I was pissed. Mm -hmm. But what the lesson that taught me was exactly what you said. As leaders, our energy influences everyone. And we have no idea. And when we know that we're off, when something doesn't feel right and you're not 100% on your game, and it's not about faking it, it's about truly being authentic to, okay, who am I? How am I going to show up today? What do I want? It's intentional. And, mm -hmm. and what you just said yeah. is so powerful as a leader, knowing that influence, put yourself in a parking lot, do whatever you need to do, and then come back in. Mm -hmm. Oh, I leave the office typically... I don't eat lunch. I mean, I'm not that guy. I don't go to lunch every day. Um, I guess from when I was installing, you just trained yourself to work because the sooner you got done, the sooner you got to go home. Um, so I've just never been a lunch person. I don't go to lunch ever, ever. Um, but I do leave the office. Um, and, and sometimes it's literally just to drive. There's a park a mile and a half from here. Um, they have a walking track and I don't always walk the track, but I walk. I'm, I'm like, my wife hates it when I get on the phone at home because I can't sit on the couch and have a conversation with you. Just sitting here right now is very hard. I have to keep readjusting because I would rather put my earbuds in and just go do laps and let, I'll talk to you for three hours, but I'm gonna be moving the whole time. And so just that walking and that moving, 
um, I just got to regroup. Sometimes again, I don't have the answers and, and I want to, I got to find them or I'll make a phone call to a mentor or a friend and say, Hey, I got to pick your brain for a second. What do you think about this? And, um, and just have that, that conversation where I can't have that in, in here. Um, and then come back and be like, all right, I'm ready. Let's, let's, let's charge the day. Let's charge the hill again. And we, we take the hill again. So, so we actually have five minutes left Ooh. and Michael said that he would stay on and answer other questions. Uh, the person who asked the question earlier said your answer was perfect. Thank you. Okay. So if anyone has any more questions, will you just put that in there? And for those of you, if you have to leave right at nine, I just want to give you your moment, Michael, if there's anything, you know, we say, this is your soapbox and I always, all the speakers, this is your moment. What's on your heart? What do you want to share? Um, what, what's your message? I think the biggest thing, I mean, the, 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 the topic was training and development. So, I mean, I want to hit that real quick and just, you know, at first, no matter where you are in life, first and foremost, understand that, that you can do it. I mean, you, you can make anything happen that you choose, right? You can live the life of your dreams or not. The choice is yours. Um, and in the beginning for me, it was, um, really training, right? I went to books and, and went to, um, you know, seminars and I, and I focused inwardly on myself and, and to get myself to be the best version of me that was possible. And then, later on, like right now, this is even when I was a trainer traveling around for seven years, it was always, you know, I got to be, I got to have the information. I got to own it and I got to know it and, I gotta, and everything else. But I really, I, I opened success for others, even chose a name based on, you know, Zig Ziglar, right? Your success in life is direct proportion to how much you help other people achieve, help other people achieve success. So for me, it was like, I'm going to go help other people be successful, which with them would make me more successful. And it's true. Um, so I mean, at that point, by, by learning and putting on all the focus on me from a training standpoint and development standpoint, it put me in a good position where I can now have influence and I can have impact. And, and um, to see that and to feel that that was all I needed. I mean, yes, the money was great, but at, at the end of the day, it was more like you change people's perspective or you change their lives. So uh, they started doing something a little bit different, which had a positive impact on their life. Now, when it comes to development, it's, it's I'm back to that spot. It's like a full circle where it's like, okay, for me now, it's not so much, yes, I need to continue to train and develop myself, but my, my focus now and in leaders out there, if you're a manager, an assistant manager, a store manager, whatever your title is, right, it, it's really about empowering other people and developing them. So, you know, helping them to see through your lens or to see that things are possible um, or to see, you know, to give them the tools, the resources they need. If they pick them up or not, that's up to them, but at least leading them to those and, and showing them and telling them, you know, why this is important and, and how it can have a positive impact. And then maybe they pick it up. And so, you know, the whole point in, in this is, is that, you know, let's go back to the beginning of the story. I mean, I'm not the smartest. I'm not in the best shape. I definitely am not going to ever have a modeling career, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm going to be super successful and I'm going to achieve everything in my wildest dreams because I chose it, um, number one, and I'm going to put in the work, number two. And if I can do it, what the hell is your excuse? I mean, seriously, I mean, it's the world is... I mean, it, were, it had been stacked against us for a long, long time, right? I mean, I always felt like I was always the underdog, right? And then you just, you can always come out on top. You can always come out on top. So, you know, put your nose down, figure out what's important to you and, and make it happen, you know, and stop the stinking thinking. Don't listen to people. You know, what do you want? And go get it. Do what you got to do and go get it. So, I love it. Uh, Isaiah is on here. He said, thank you so much. This has helped me. Renee Verklin, your bold buddy. Um, <laughs> Just says both of you have crazy positive infectious energy. I have a question here. What are some of your favorite books or authors for self development? Well, self development, bold. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not a plug. I swear to God, it's not a plug. Um, the most powerful class I've ever been to, self immersion, was bold, hands down. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that and that was something that you know Rusty had sponsored me into. And uh, I was scared and nervous, but hands down, I would, I would lead that. I, I would say bold. I would say Marion and Eric are going to be the people that will, will, will help the most in that area, really unleashing that power within. I mean, of course, Tony Robbins, I like, um, you know, for me, you know, John Maxwell, I mean, there's a lot of influence. It's, it's, it's not any one person. It's just, it's just more or less a, uh, um, submersion right I mean it's just about surrounding yourself with 
with that, I mean, the biggest thing for me is who am I surrounding myself with? Um, who, who is it I'm spending time with throughout the day and what are their thoughts like? So if, you know, I'm blessed to have people in my life that, that are at a higher level than me that achieve even higher things then if shit, if I could just get to their level, I would be stoked or I think I'd be stoked, but then they're looking for that next level. And, it, and it's that, it, that's, I think the people around us is what's most. So what are your influences like? And I would change those negative Nancy's people that are going to tell me, I can't do something. I can't do something. I can't do something. And I don't care who they are. They're out of my life. Um, you know, or our conversations are limited. I mean, I can't, can't ask family, not saying I would, cause I know they're all on, but the negative Nancy stuff, like, you know, who, when they say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. It's fine. We're, we're, I'm always going to have time for my family, but I'm not going to give them real estate up here. And, and our conversations won't be about my hopes and my rainbows and my unicorns. It'll be about their day. Like, hey, tell me about your day. Oh, cool, cool. What else is going on? Oh, that's awesome. All right, I got to go. Right. Versus I'm not here to share, share, share. So really look at your influences more than anything else and surround yourself with people who are on the same mission as you um, or, or looking for that mission and then get to a bold class. I mean, and, and be put, you know, I'll never forget Mr. Eric McGrath and, 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 and he just, he just put me in my place and it was just, um, it was what I needed. I mean, it was good. Nobody had ever challenged me the way that he challenged. Nobody ever pushed me the way that he pushed me. You as well, Mary. Um, but it, it, it changed me. And so that, again, it was, uh, that's what I would suggest. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, all right. Well, I just want to say thank you again, Michael. Thank you everyone for being on here. And, I, you know, I can speak for everyone who's watching and all the comments that are going on here that I am grateful to know you. When I look at you, you know, you have this such crazy infectious energy and you can sell your guidance counselor to let you drop out of school. You can sell anything, but at the core, what I know about you is you are one of the most authentic people. And when you let people in and see you, who you talk about the emotion, mm -hmm. that's what drives the connection. And I really believe that is part of the reason why your company grew so much is because of who you are as a leader, what you stand for. Not that it is ever always perfect, but it's your mindset. You walk your talk. And even though, you know, sometimes you might fall down, you get back up and you own it. And I'm just grateful from the bottom of my heart for that you said yes. <laughs> and so grateful that you're in my life. You inspired me. Like today, I was like, whoo, you're filling me oh. up. You know, where, where am I, you know, challenge? I got to challenge some of my stinking thinking. And we all have it. Like every single human, we have to challenge our thoughts. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, it's awesome. It's good. Let's, let's make today a very productive and profitable day. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye for now, everyone. Have an amazing day and we will see you next Tuesday.